Oh. Oh, wow. Hello, folks. Wow. Clicks keyboard aggressively. That's right. I know. Um, okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, RB Tree. Haven't seen you in a while. Welcome on in. Um, class did pretty good on the exam. Um, and uh yeah the material is definitely going to be heating up here soon so um keep uh, uh playing around with uh, the specific groups that you have find as many homomorphisms between them find as many subgroups of every group that you've ever encountered so that uh you have a large list of um experiences that you can lean on uh, especially which are especially useful for true and false questions okay 
So um, what's going on this week? So the major idea that I'm introducing this week is the idea of a group action. That's the central concept um, that this week is, uh, that we introduced this week. Um, and um, in, the, uh, in this discussion of group actions, at least this first uh, introduction week, I will um, get to a thing, uh, uh, sort of something that everybody who studies math uh, learns at some point, it's called the orbit stabilizer theorem. Um, and uh, that's the sort of abstract uh, goal that we're going to have this week and um, uh, concerning the concept of group actions. And so I have to, I'll have to tell you what orbits and stabilizers mean. Um, and then we'll look at a fun example. We'll look at a bunch of examples because uh, that's the most important thing to do when you see an abstract concept. Um, and so the idea of a group action will be like universal. You'll see it all over math and it's used all the time. So it's important to know the language surrounding it. Um, okay, I also intend to uh, use the word automorphism at least once this week. And the specific kind of automorphism I'd like to talk about when I introduce that concept is uh, conjugation in a group. Okay? Um, and... Uh, so if you want to read about what conjugation is, um, you can read the very first page of, believe it or not, chapter 24. The book sort of splits some group theory towards the end um, and some of the other group theory in the beginning, so it's not, don't be scared because that is chapter 24. It's just how the book is organized. Okay, so um, you can just read the beginning of chapter 24 to get the, the definition of what conjugation is. And it's at that level that I'll talk about it um, if, I, if I get to talk about it. All right. And then, uh, looking forward to next week, um, I intend to begin the discussion surrounding the very important discussion of um, when you can divide a group by a subgroup. And so you'll finally understand why we use, why Zmod NZ is just one type of instance where you use a division symbol to create a new group out of an old group. Um, and that process of taking a quotient is a little bit subtle. And so we'll have to learn um, what's involved, uh, the, the sort of uh, look under the hood at what exactly is required of us if we want to create a quotient group out of a current out of a group and a subgroup of it okay so that's chapter nine um, if you want to read ahead and uh, orbit stabilizer and group action discussion is in chapter seven okay and I definitely won't be able to um, talk about chapter eight during this week's lecture so students, I ask that you go ahead and read chapter eight on your own. It's pretty um, simple material, the chapter eight stuff. But if you have questions about it, you should definitely ask during office hours and or just on the discord. Like, what, what does this theorem mean? What are they saying? Can I see an example, etc.? cetera? And um, I'd, I'll be happy to talk about it, but I can't devote 45 minutes. Uh, I have 45 minutes for a lecture. So I have to choose my battles here. Okay, group action. Let's go uh, talk about what the heck a group action is. Okay, let's dive right in. The concept of a group action. Now, if you go looking at different sources, different books, you'll see that um, a group action, uh, you'll see different ways of defining the notion of a group action. But what's always present is the following. In the, the, the context, the context is there's a group, G is a group, 
And then there will be a set. And what uh, what we will give meaning to, what we what we're just right now, what we're about to give meaning to, the goal is we want to give meaning to the phrase. The group G acts on the set X. All right. So um, let me let me give you an instance of this kind of a situation. You've we've already actually seen. You you've already seen this without it being defined in various situations in life. So. Here's an example before I'd even tell you what the definition is. Um, the group D5 acts on the regular pentagon. And that's because every element of the group produces a permutation of the pentagon that's the content of this statement every element of the group produces a permutation of the pentagon but it's kind of systematic in that if you take two elements of the group and you multiply them the two permutations when you multiply them will produce the permutation that corresponds to the product in the in the group D5. So the product structure in the group D5 is in alignment with the composition structure when you're talking about permuting an object. Just compose one permutation with a second one. So um, D5 acts on the regular pentagon. D4 acts on the square. Okay, well, I'll confuse you a little bit, but also Um, D5 acts on the unit circle. Okay, and that's because every one of these the activities in D5, like rotate or flip across any of these five axes that the pentagon might have. Okay, if you look at the unit circle that the pentagon is sitting in, for example, all of these activities induce a permutation on the unit circle as well. And so D5 induces a bunch of movements or action on the unit circle as well. So in this example, the set will be, so in this example, X is the regular pentagon in this example, and X is the unit circle. Uh, in in the second example, these are two different contexts, but a group is acting on some object via permutations of that object. So I'm going to give you one definition of what a group action is. So definition number one. Um, this is probably the most elegant definition that you'll find. It's like the shortest um, sentence definition. Um, so the definition is this, a group, an action of the group G on a set X is a homomorphism action A, I guess, from the group G to the group of permutations of the set X. This is the group of the set of all bijections. Pi for permutation, P. Okay, so permutation just means a bijection from the set to itself. And how do you compose? How do you multiply two permutations? Composition. That's always the uh, 
the um, implicit group law on a permutation set. Yes, the videos are on YouTube, definitely. Okay, so that's the one line definition of what an action of a group G on a set X is. It's simply a homomorphism from the group to the set of permutations on this group. So let me tell you in words what that means. So in other words, um, in words, for each element in the group, we are assigning a permutation a sub i'm going to give subscript a sub g of the set x to itself meaning a permutation of the set x a permutation of a set x is a bijective mapping from the x, from x to into itself okay all right so every every element in the group is assigned a transformation a jumbling a scrambling of the set x within itself okay an invertible scrambling okay but it's done in a systematic way it's done so that in such a way that um the permutation um assigned to um, the product GH is um, the uh, uh, the composition first do H then do G so this is this is the what I'm doing here is just writing out the the content of the word homomorphism rather than a random assignment a random function from the elements of the group G to permutations. It needs to be a systematic assignment. So the group structure on G transforms into the composition structure in permutation. It's in alignment with the composition structure in, in the set of permutations on a given object X. Okay. So, so also, you know, also, you have all these other things like um, the the permutation attached or as assigned to the identity element is the identity function which takes an element and on and outputs itself that simple identity function okay you get that if if um, if uh, the um, if the permutation assigned to G is denoted G a sub G, which is what I've been doing, then the permutation assigned to G inverse. Okay. Um, is the inverse permutation, the opposite function, the undoing of a sub g. All right. So in in confusing, I mean, it, it's a in, in beautiful notation. Um, this is how you write that. All right, so I'm just going through what happens when you have a homomorphism, but I want you to notice that it's not a random assignment of a permutation for every element of the group. It's a systematic one where the product structure in the group um, gets sent maps onto maps to the composition structure of permutations. All right, so for for now we revisit our examples. Okay, so let's draw a pentagon. As good as I can conceivably draw a pentagon. All right, regular pentagon. That's as good as it's going to get.
and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna show you a set X X is the sort of filled in Pentagon let's say let's just pretend this I'm just making up an uh, an object a set and I'm gonna map a particular I'm gonna produce an action of a particular group on this object okay so X is that Pentagon then um, then there is a homomorphism from D5 to a set of permutations of this set. Okay, and let me tell you the rule for this homomorphism. Whenever someone tells you they have a homomorphism and it's just, they just draw an arrow, they have not told you anything. In fact, the group acts like a function. Yeah, the group acts like a, not any kind of function, an invertible function, a bijection from the set to itself. Uh, it's a function that can be undone with another function. And those are basically the bijections. Okay? Like a re reversible jacket. Uh, Gath, wonderful. A rever I guess a reversible jacket. Wonderful, Gath. Yes. A, it's a RB tree. It's a transformation of the object. A transformation that does not, that, that can be undone with another transformation. Right? Um... So that's that's what's happening. Okay, so then there's a homomorphism from the group to this permutation. Let me tell you what it is in words. So I have to tell you the formula. Um, for, for each element, rotation slash flip in uh, D5, you output the effect of that rotation on the pentagon x okay so um we are this we are we are we are um purposefully separating a group which is just a bunch of like e's and g's and a product structure and a notion of inverse from the way the group might manifest as the symmetry of some object. We are purposefully decoupling those because the same group can manifest in other ways for other objects beyond any one person's conception. There are just way too many opportunities in mathematics for there to be an object which has symmetries that are, that are sort of common with the symmetries of a pentagon. So it's bad form. It is bad practice to attach to give your to attach a group only to a specific object as this object's symmetries. What we're doing is we're, we're giving a tool to a language to say that this group also acts on that set in this way. It also acts on this set in this way. It acts on the same set in multiple different ways. The same set can inherit several different actions of a, of a fixed particular group. So um, here, th that's what we're basically setting up. That's, what, that's the language and the concept that we're setting up here. All right, so this is, but this is the textbook example. You have the dihedral groups. They act on the sort of regular n-gon that, you know, sort of produced, sort of gave birth to the definition of the dihedral group. So it's kind of a silly um, example, but it's still, it's like the first example you can, you can witness. All right, so the second, the second one, the second example I said was actually, uh, there's also an action. This was the second example. Um, D5 acts on the unit circle too. All right, so now in this picture, now my set is the green circle. This green circle. Let's call this 
S uh, S1. I'm just gonna call it S1 because it's a uh, a circle which is a one-dimensional sphere. One-dimensional sphere. That's the math way of saying circle. Okay. So how does it act on S1? I'll tell you the recipe. There's an action. I'll, I'll give it a different name. Uh, there's an action. Um, um, alpha prime from D5 to there's a homomorphism from D5 to the permutations of the circle. And it's given by the same rule, same exact type of rule, a rotation flash flip gets sent to the permutation on S1 induced by that rotation slash flip. Okay, so there's this, uh, just because D5 is only related to the pentagon doesn't mean that it can't act on bigger things or other things. It can act on all sorts of things. All right, so D5 can act on the circle. Um, what does rotate by whatever that angle is, 72? What does it do to the circle? It's the permutation called do that on the circle. It's it, D5 manifests as a particular group of operations done on this object called S1. Okay? In fact, actually, um, D5 acts on all of R2. via the same recipe. So look at this. I just want you to witness the, um, the vastness of this concept. So yes, D5 acts on the Pentagon. When someone tells you that, it's like, okay, of course it does. That's, uh, that's kind of obvious. All right, so in this case, X was the Pentagon in the first example. In the second example, X, X was the unit circle. Okay, um, this in the third example, X is all of R2, the whole plane. Amazing. All right, so now I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a sentence and now you know how to sort of understand it. So now you'll, you can make sense of the following. The following sentence, the action by this, I mean the action that's just been described earlier of uh, the obvious action. The action of D5 on R2 does not restrict to an action of D5 on, and I'm going to show you a set. on this set here in yellow. Okay? The action of D5 on, on, on the plane does not restrict to an action of D5 on X. That's because the permutations of of the plane that are produced by elements of D5 do not permute this subset X. They don't keep this subset X preserved within itself. All right? Um, arbitrary D5, does D5 act on GL2? It does, but not in, uh, that's a confusing action. It's slightly different from uh, the statement that I just made. GL2 is a different set from R2, uh, and so your that action is is a little bit different. 
but there is a way in which d5 acts on gl2. Absolutely. Okay, but um, so so now you can you can make sense of this statement. The action of d5 on r2 does not restrict to an action of d5 on x, because the elements, all the elements of d5 don't preserve this subset within itself. They don't induce permutations of this subset. Because some of the elements in D5 will send this thing, this subset will become some other blob. Like rotate, like R. The concept of R, rotate 270, the action of, the action of the element R We'll take this set to this other set, x prime, or r of x, if you want to call it that, right? r of 72 degrees or whatever it's called, okay? Even flip, flip over x-axis will not produce a permutation of this subset x. So d5, the action of the ambient thing doesn't restrict to an action of the sub thing. Okay, so, that, so now you can say these kinds of sentences confidently. Okay, so next, what I'm going to show you, uh, possibly just to like ruin your life and confuse you, but really it's to prepare you for like, when you go looking for other sources to find the same notion, you're going to find a rather confusing other way that uh, people define an action. So um, the other, the other way to define it. Okay, so an action of a group G on a set X is a function. It's a function, I'm going to call it um, capital A. It's a function that takes a pair of an element of a group, comma, an element in the set, and outputs an element in the set. And um, so the it's a it's a it's a particular kind of function from pairs, group element, comma, element in the set, to an element in the set. And it's and it's usually denoted by just shorthand by G, and it's very confusing. A little dot on the it's like a period. G period X. Okay, and th that's that's just shorthand notation for what is a of g comma x. So this is shorthand. For the output of this function on that pair. Okay, and this function has to obey a bunch of uh, properties. Obeying. All right. Um, I'll just throw a bunch out there. Okay, so um, e dot x equals x for every element in the set. All right. So identity um, acting on an element in the set is always that same element in the set. Okay. Two. Um, if, uh, if you take a product in the group and act on an element in the set, you get the same thing as if you took just G and acted on this element of the set. So notice that everything parses. This is again an element in X. All right, and then three. Um, so uh, three is like um, okay. Ha, ha, if if g dot x equals the element y, okay. If if you give this element the name y, then g inverse dot y is the element x okay so these are different axioms that this concept of 
dotting with an element in G, dotting or hitting an element of X with an with a group element, hitting X with a group element. This activity has to obey these kinds of rules that if you hit an element in the set with the product of two group elements, it's the same effect as hitting it with X, like H first and then taking that output point and hitting that point with G. All right, so you can see the sort of um, the rumblings of the concept of a homomorphism um, in this in this definition. All right, so so the fact that these two things define the same kind of object is left to the student for now. You can ask me in office hours to go over the equivalence, but this new kind of this new this new definition of an action is equivalent is equivalent data to the old definition okay so i'm going to use the language or notation in the new definition in the context of our of our running examples really fast to show you how to think about this notation an element of the group hitting a member of the set on which the group is acting so let's let's witness that definition at least the notation in it in action so here's an example of uh, a pentagon Great. That's a perfect pentagon, obviously. And now I'm going to pick this element here, X. All right. X is an element in my set capital X, which is the whole pentagon. Okay, my group. My group. All right. And now I'm going to tell you what does a group element dot X mean? What does R dot X mean in our in the context of our understood group action of D5 on the Pentagon? In our um, D5 action on the Pentagon. What does group element dot X mean? It means the output, the effect. What does, where does R send the little element X? What output point does the permutation attached to R, what's the output of the little X under the permutation attached to R? So here's, where R, here's what R dot X is concretely. So R was uh, rotate uh, seven, 72 degrees, uh, 72 you know, counterclockwise. Okay, so you, you just take this and you rotate and it'll be here. This yellow dot is R dot X. R dot X is another element in the set X. It is the, if it is what, the permutation R attached to R did to the element, individual element called X. Okay. All right. So, um, D5, okay, D5 is, is, is isomorphic to a subgroup of GL2, RB tree, 100%. Yes. Okay. So that's what R dot X means. What is F? What is flip dot X? What does flip dot X mean? In this picture. It is the, it is, it is the um, output of X under 
the permutation um, of capital X assigned to our element F in the group. There's an assignment of a permutation per element of the group. That's what an action does. That's what an action is, okay? And so what is the flip? And remember, this flip was um, confusingly um, flip across. I'll just draw a line so that you don't get confused. It's this line. Okay, flip across that line. It's a perfect symmetry of this perfect pentagon, clearly. So what is f dot x? It simply means this point. All right. So the way to think about group action is a group is moving the points of a set around in a systematic way so that the group multiplication corresponds to composition of movement. That's what a group action is. And this idea of a group manifesting as a bunch of movements on a set is so commonly occurring, it's impossible to give a sense of how important this language is to download if you want to learn higher, if you want to pr proceed in higher mathematics. It's just very, very... Um, ubiquitous this concept of a group acting on a set okay so it, it it's very right now our discussion is a bit abstract um but it's very important that you understand that the group d5 is not the pentagon the pentagon is a shape the group d5 is a collection of transformations D5 has 10 elements in it. It's a set that has 10 elements. The pentagon has infinitely many elements inside of it. I mean, look at all the little dots in there. What's the connection between D5 and the pentagon? The precise relationship is D5 acts on the pentagon. That's the relationship between the group and this object that immediately comes up in your mind when you think of D5. But the group is the group. And the object is the object. And the group acts on this object via symmetries of that object. Permutations of that object. This is the language we're developing. Great. Okay. So now I'm going to, instead of saying what, uh, um, instead of creating some definitions, boring definitions, which are very important, um, we don't have enough time to give them justice right now, so I'll shift that for the next class. But I'm going to show you a different set that a group acts on. Okay. So here, let's do a weird example. A funny example. Okay. Okay, so um, a store... No, no I, 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 won't, I won't tell a story. Uh, Maybe I'll tell a story next time with a word problem or something. But um, here's, here's what I'm going to define. A necklace. A length 5 necklace is the following thing. You take the pentagon. And... Um, You color the vertices either red or blue. All right, so here's a necklace. Here's one particular necklace of length five. It has five beads. Five bead necklace, and you place it on the ground so that one of them is right at the, you know, sideways point, and you make a little perfect pentagon out of it. And you only use two colors, let's say. Two colors, a, a red, blue, 
a red, blue. I'm, this is going to take forever for me to write, but a red and blue length five necklace is a, pent, a pentagon that whose whose corners have been colored either red or blue. That's what it is. Okay. If you're a net, if you're a necklace manufacturer, this is an important definition for you. This is a real world example. Okay. So you got this concept of a necklace length five. It's either red or blue. Just the pentagon with colorings of its vertices. All right. So like how many red blue necklaces are there? Like how many of these pictures can you draw? That's a good question. So um, according to our the way we're talking about this, there are uh, two to the five red blue necklaces. Um, just right now, uh, without saying anything more clever, there seems to be two to the five different ways of coloring the vertices of this pentagon. That's all. Okay? Choose uh, red or blue on each vertex. That's all I'm saying. That's all I intend to say here when I say this statement. Okay, but now uh, here's a statement that that's interesting. So let um, let X equal the set of all possible red-blue necklaces. Meaning, it's the set of all colorings of this, of the vertices of the pentagon. Okay? And so what we know is that um, the size of this set is 2 to the 5. This set has 32 elements in it. Okay, so here's a set. And I'm going to make a, a, a grand statement that hopefully has some meaning to you after this lecture. So here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a legitimate sentence. The group D5 acts on the set of all necklaces, of all, on the set X. Okay, again, it's, it's very much like, oh, there's a homomorphism between this group and that group. Okay, great, but you need to tell me the formula for that homomorphism. You need to tell me what is that homomorphism. In the same way, when someone says that a group D5 acts on the set of all necklaces, all conceivable red, blue, length 5 necklaces, you need to ask them, you just confirm with them, what is the action? And in this case, they're going to say the action is kind of the obvious action, but let me tell you what they mean. The action is... is for each rotation slash flip um, you send it to the permutation of the set of necklaces called take a necklace take a necklace apply that rotation and you produce a new necklace take any necklace apply that rotation to get a new necklace. New means possibly new. Could be the same. This is describing a crazy permutation on this 32 element set. Every necklace in combination with a rotation will produce a third neck a second necklace so it's actually easier to write it using the dot notation so in in dot notation for example rotate dot this necklace blue blue 
Red, red, red. This is this is an element in X. Rotate dot this necklace equals. This equals is this is how I'm defining my action. It equals, okay, now you take that necklace and you do this to it. Do rotate by 72 degrees. Equals this necklace. Okay, it's gonna be um, red, blue, blue. Red, 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 like this. Okay, I rotated it by uh, 72 degrees clockwise. That's what R means. Okay, so that's this this notion of dot obeys the um, homomorphism property. If you do rotate, if you do a, a transformation and then a second one, and you look at the effect of that on a necklace, it's the sequential effect applied to each individual like uh, intermediate necklace that was visited. One for applying H and one for applying G, for example, afterwards. All right, so this is, this is a typical situation where a group acts on a combinatorially complicated set. The set of all distinct ways of decorating a given shape. This usually a group will act on that set and you'll be interested in like combinatorics problems. You'll be interested in studying the action of D5 on the set of all necklaces. And let me tell you why you'll be interested in that. So let me ask a funny question. So um, obviously uh, these two necklaces are the same necklace, so to speak. So to speak. Right? It, it, it's kind of strange to call the first necklace different from the second. However, the advantage of not making things the same early on is that it's easy to count the th when the rules were more rigid. When we, could, when we declared that these two were separate necklaces, it was easy to count that there were two to the five different possibilities. But once someone starts to ask, how many, you know, honestly distinct necklaces are there? What you're going to have to, what, what, what we build is a system of using this group action to make this harder counting problem, how many truly distinct necklaces are there, easier. We'll, we'll develop language and tools for helping us count these kinds of combinatorial uh, he headaches. But these headaches essentially stem from the existence of a complicated set and a group acting on that set. What to draw when you have this situation comes next time. The set X will decompose into funny things called orbits. And then the group will have special subgroups of it called stabilizers. And that those two concepts of orbits and stabilizers, which arise when you have a group acting on a set, will be the subject of Wednesday's class, probably the whole class. All right? Okay. So, um, let me now look at, let me now look at the uh, chat for questions or comments or anything um, concerning, hopefully concerning the idea of a group action. Let's see if the class um, has any questions. All right, let me look at this. Want to become famous? Buy followers, primes, and views on this place. All right, I'll, I'll check that out. Um, let's see. Hmm, I thought about my previous question. I wonder if D5 is a subgroup of GL2. Yeah, yes, it's it's isomorphic to a subgroup of GL2. Correct. Um, 
All right, good. So there weren't there weren't that many questions. All right, uh, let's check. Oh, someone is asking a question on Discord, so I'll I'll wait for that. Um, or or they're making a comment. So let me wait for that before I stop the stream. Let me let me thank people. So um, journey in AI. Thank you for following. Trouser. Thank you for following. And Lim, thank you for following. Um, Ravenstein, thank you for following. Uh, known, known on sense, <laughs> thank you for following. Great names. Okay, what does slot say? How orbit and stabilizer relates to what we just learned. Okay, slot. Let me let me say that a little bit better. It was just I just tacked it on at the end. Okay, so when you have Um, the situation of a group G acting on a set X in some way which the person has to like specify to you always then um, two notion two ideas concepts are born one will be the idea of an orbit, the orbit of a point in the set. This will be a particular subset of the set X, and it's born when you choose a particular point in the set X. That'll give rise to its orbit. All right. And two, um, the stabilizer of a given point in the set. This will be a sub, a particular kind of subgroup. It's a subgroup of the group G. The orbit will be a subset of the set X. It's just that these two concepts of an orbit and a stabilizer the orbit of a point in the set and the stabilizer of a point in the set. These two ideas are born when you have the situation of a group acting on a set. That's all I intend to say. Uh, that's all we... Uh, that's, that's the relationship. The relationship is you can't talk about an orbit or a stabilizer without having a group action present. Okay, so orbit of a point under a group action stabilizer of a point under a particular group action those two concepts come only after you introduce the concept of a group action okay so um between now and wednesday class um try to come up with ways in which your big bag individual groups in your bag act on strange sets just cr think of other sets that maybe some of your groups act on via uh, permutations of that set. Um, uh, see how creative you can get with um, constructing actions of groups on sets. Um, you can you can guarantee that on the true false part uh, the, in the true false exam weekly exam, I will test whether uh, a particular thing I just define is actually a group action or not. You can. You can mostly expect that, unless I have no more room. I can't pack more into the exam. So uh, that's something that I would, right now, I would definitely want to uh, check whether students understand what's a group action and what doesn't count, what doesn't m create a group action. Um, so uh, just go and try to create various actions of a group on your favorite group on different mathematical objects or even maybe non-mathematical objects <laughs> and that could be even more fun all right i know sure shack yeah hey sloth oh okay yeah um rotations represented by matrices yes arbitrary you've you've got it right you you have the right neurons in the right place okay so now i have to go and uh, 
make up a lecture for um, Calc 2, where I teach partial fraction decomposition or something. Um, so that's... Which, by the way, students, uh, the existence of the partial fraction decomposition, maybe you remember this from Calc 2, but the fact that the partial fraction decomposition works is actually a theorem in ring theory. So that's a... Uh, it's an instance of a theorem from the theory of rings, which will be the third or one of the, the second third or the third third of the class. So kind of funny how uh, the two subjects are in alignment right now. Um, but that's that's kind of the point of algebra. The point of algebra is to see many, many diverse phenomena as actually just one instance, uh, two instances of the same underlying thing. And so if you look at this concept of a group action, that's exactly the kind of general kind of construction that you can imagine fits many different contexts. And so if we can gather what's generally true about every one of these situations, that's a good thing. We, someone should write that down. And we have. And we end up with these simple concepts like an orbit and a stabilizer and we'll learn what their relationship is um, so that you can use it every other time that every specific time that it shows up in some specific math class. That's the nature of abstract algebra. Okay. All right. Let's get out of here. Um, I don't know who's out there. Let's see. Who's out there? Maybe we can go somewhere. Um, Oh, well, there's the standard choice. Let's see. Is, is, is Peter out there? Yeah, but we gotta, we gotta, we gotta, okay. Oh no. All right, yeah, let's go to Melko. Oh yeah, absolutely, RB Tree. Thanks for coming. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I think I'll just go with Melko. Melko's always a safe bet. Melko, I can count on to not say some terrible bad word right when I enter. He, Melko, you know, he's he's a straight shooter. He's really uh, reliable. Okay, so um, let's go. Let's go. Go 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 visit Melko and learn some. Uh, let's see. You, it looks like you'll be learning some uh, just chatting. So that's, that's an interesting thing. All right, start this raid. Maybe, hopefully it works. Yeah, it's gonna work. All right, go, go say, go spread the love to Melko. Um, and uh, go tell him about group actions, okay? That groups can act, a group can act on a molecule, okay? As, as its symmetries. That's a group action. Yeah, okay, that, that was science. Ready? Here's, here goes the raid. See you guys later.